Hi, I'm Caitlin. Hi, I'm Rebecca. We're not from Memphis, but we love it. Welcome to Memphis Pipe History, the podcast. Okay. <laughs> good evening, Caitlin. Uh, good morning, Rebecca. We are here to talk about dead people. Yes, particularly a famous cemetery known as Elmwood in Memphis off of E.H. Crump. I have some facts that are not related to geography in that it was <laughs> established in 1852. Mm-hmm. It is one of Tennessee's oldest nonprofits. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's 80 acres. Yep. And 75,000 people have been laid to rest there. At, yeah, at least. there. Oh. Yeah. Can I give the story of Elmwood? Yeah. And then tell me, did you learn about people who have been buried there? Yeah, I have uh, one big, one main person to tell you about, and then a couple others, uh, short little blurbs. Okay. And I also um, know a little bit about the style of the cemetery. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Okay. So you want to tell the story, and then if you end up not talking about the style, I'll talk about that for just a second. Yeah, I'll leave that up for you. For ya. All right. For you. Uh, <laughs> it's early. <laughs> Okay. So Elmwood, as we know, it began with 50 men. Okay. They bought this uh, 40 acres of land, and to determine what they were going to name it, they drew names from a hat. And the name that they came up with was Elmwood. But then they all looked around and realized there are no elms here. Um, Uh, Who put that in the hat? I don't know the name of any of the 50 (laughs) men. (laughs) But why would you think, like, let me put... This and a hat. We have none of these trees here, but it'd make a great name. It made a great name. And then they thought about what, you know, what comes with Elmwood. Oh, the trees. And, oh, there are no Elmwoods. Wow. So they had them imported from New York. Ooh, fancy. Yeah. If you uh, walk in the park or the cemetery, there are 60 species of trees. But if you spot an elm, you'll know that that's not older than the actual cemetery. Uh, Another thing about the cemetery, or at least whenever I went down there, uh, you can find a blog post already on Memphis Type History. It is called Elmwood Cemetery. (laughs) I can't remember. Uh, Yeah, if you go to MemphisTypeHistory.com and search Elmwood, it will come up. Yes, thank you. Yes. The bell tower was one of the interesting little pieces, which you probably talk about the style mm. of that. No? Okay, good. No, I'm just, just going to talk about, like, the general style. So, yeah, this. tell me about the bell tower. Okay. I liked it because it wasn't originally stationed where it is now, which is at the front gate right after you get over the bridge. It was in a different entrance when the, the cemetery originally opened. And every time a burial would come through or a body would come through to be buried, someone would go and ring the bell tower, and that was to notify the superintendent, hey, our funeral's arrived. Oh. And so, you know, because, you know, it's back in the day when there aren't any text or phone calls. But they've kept that tradition alive even now. So every time somebody drives over the bridge, the bells is rung. So that's a little Elmwood tradition that's kept going. But a person doesn't ring it anymore, right? It's like automated or? I assume it's still a person. I think it's the same bell and I didn't get word that it was turned electric. Cool. But I'll check on that next time I go back there. <laughs> I go, that, that goes to show that I, I do go back to Elmwood. It's a very pleasant place. So it's 40 acres of land. After the Civil War, the cemetery doubled in size. So that's how it got to be the 80 acres that it is now. Yeah. And I was going to talk about a plot, or it's not just a plot, an area of the cemetery that's called No Man's Land, if you're interested. Yes, but first, can I tell you why you like to go there and why it feels pleasant, even though it's a cemetery? Yes, I do. Let's hear about this now. Okay, so it's just going to be super quick, but you're not the only person that likes to go and like, it's almost more like a park, right? Yes. I just called it a park earlier. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So that's because it's in Victorian style. Mm-hmm. So are you watching The Crown by any chance, or have you watched The Crown on Netflix? Oh, I have. I loved it. Okay. So you know Queen Victoria in that show, 
and her husband, Albert. Mm -hmm. When he died, she spent her whole life mourning him, basically. And you kind of can see that in that show. Mm -hmm. Um, I really like that show a lot. I was sad when I finished the season. (laughs) Um, So her, like, style of mourning, she kind of made it a whole thing, almost like a culture, like a trend of mourning. And so cemeteries became like a bit of a reflection of the art of mourning. So that's why like the monuments are really decorated. You see a lot of urns and things like that because cemeteries changed from being practical to more like a park and a place where you would like spend time and contemplate um, and just like be there and like want to be there because it was like nice yeah so it was a way to get the life to come back to visit the dead yeah and I guess like because she had this like art form of mourning and her whole life was about mourning she like I guess if you spend a lot of time in a cemetery you want it to look prettier or whatever Mm -hmm. so (laughs) that's so it's Victorian style because of Queen Victoria and it's it's got all those like ornate details and stuff it does so that's part of why you like to be there just because it like feels not like a cemetery in some ways like it feels like a place of contemplation and like reflection yeah and I'll add to you go different seasons and there's different colors because of the Mm -hmm. landscape that they've put there and on top of that they also do tours like the haunted tours they do um they started this past last year uh the hitchcock movie series and so we would go (laughs) bring yeah (laughs) you could bring your lawn chair and pay for a movie ticket and watch you know hitchcock movie and they only did two it was uh birds and i'm blanking on the other one dial in for murder no, it was the one where... I like that one. This guy's been paying attention to his neighbor who oh, killed his the, wife. the room, the window, the, window. the room yes. or the window. The window. Yes. That one's so it good. It was really it's good. It's creepy. <laughs> um, nice. And so they project the screen on their on the front office uh, roof, which also is it has a gift shop inside. So this kind of gives you a glimpse of also just the quirkiness that Elmwood has, that even visitors come because it is the oldest cemetery. It's beautiful. And people like me are welcome to go have, I've had picnics there. You know, I, I don't know anybody deceased there. I, uh, I just enjoy it. So, yeah. You're a regular Queen Victoria, Rebecca. Yes. Well, yes. Thank you. So um, that was my little tangent because um, I just I thought I really liked the crown and it was like a tie-in. Yeah, so, no, I love learning that. Plot of land. <laughs> Back to the more than plot. Uh, so as I mentioned, the Civil War doubled the cemetery size, and just think there was this is when a mass burial take took place because all these Confederate soldiers died, nurses, doctors, and and then the slaves and. You can go there, and there's one monument for the slaves. and um, But then after that was, do you want to guess what happened that would have caused a mass burial? An epidemic? It was an epidemic. You know which oh, one? The yellow fever. Yes. Good job, Caitlin. <laughs> and so there were six cases of, of yellow fever epidemic that occurred in Memphis. It was 1928, 1855, 1867, 1873, and the worst of all was 1878 to 1879. But the peak of it was 1878. So the 1878 swept, sweeps through the city. About 25,000 fled the city. They left. And of the 19,000 who remained in Memphis, 17,000 contracted yellow fever. Uh, That's insane. It's a lot. It's quite a bit. So just think of this. Okay, so nurses, doctors, clergymen, all these people uh, are trying to help and obviously contracting this disease. There were 41 officers that were still in the city, but only seven of them were fit for duty. Wow. Uh, So now the only people that could go out were the collectors of the dead. And so they get in their wa- their horse and wagon, drive out to the streets and shout out, bring out your dead. Bring out your dead. Bring out your bring dead. Bring out your dead. Uh-huh. I'm not dead. <laughs> well, there were cases of people not being dead and put in the coffin. It's, and they were, it's a Monty Python reference there oh, for you. Oh, look at that. 
Which, <laughs> but I'm not dead. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. It was true. All right. There was Sorry. truth in that. I was like, yes. There's a lot of truth in Monty Python's like, she's making movies. fed of the undead, undead that got put in the coffins. Oh, man. Oh, how awful. Every time I hear a story about something like that, it just, ugh, I can't. Yeah. Maybe I'll watch some Monty Python to help. Oh, it's so funny. It's uh, the, ser- the Search for the Holy Grail. Oh, is I have the- seen that. Man, it was years ago. We have that. I'm so bummed I made the one movie reference that I probably will ever pick up on in our entire <laughs> podcasting careers. And you and I like, out. are you making fun of people? <laughs> it's okay. It's really early. I'll give you a pass. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Gosh. Um, that's right. He made the horse sounds with the coconuts. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So much good stuff in that one. Um, yes. Yeah, so bring out your dad. They loaded up these wagons. Oh, sorry. Yeah, with, with corpses. And they take the, take them out to the cemetery. Because it was at this time that people believed the deceased were the ones that were spreading this uh, disease so quickly. And so in their heads, they needed to get, get these bodies into the ground as quickly as possible. So if you imagine the task of burying the dead is super overwhelming and many of the deceased didn't receive a proper funeral, a, po- a proper burial, even. So enter Elmwood. Okay, wagons of bodies are arriving each day, and they're bur- being buried at the cemetery. And at the same time, sometimes there were just citizens that would have a body over their shoulder, carrying them with a shovel in hand, and they would just find a, a spot and bury that body. So you have this going on. And so now there stands a single monument with the name No Man's Land. Ah. Okay? So you can go there in this one single headstone. And I'm going to read what it says to you. It says, No Man's Land. In four public lots known collectively as No Man's Land lie the remains of at least 1,400 victims of the Great Yellow Fever epidemics of 1873, 1878, and 1879. Memphis lost over 8,500 citizens to the disease and 2,500 of these rest at Elmwood. At the peak of these outbreaks, Elmwood was, re- Elmwood was required to handle over 50 burials a day. Due to the sickness and labor shortages, many bodies were piled above ground, awaiting burial. Persons from all levels of society were interred in trenches in an area formerly reserved for paupers and unknowns. By 1878, half of Memphis's 50,000 citizens fled the city, Yellow fever struck 90% of the remaining population, killing 5,100. The epidemic so decimated its population that Memphis became bankrupt in 1879 and was declared a taxing district of Nashville. So that's how serious this disease was. And anyone who's interested in the history of the yellow fever should read The American Plague, which is on my list of books to read because I know how serious it is. Wow, interesting, mm-hmm. yeah. We'll put a link to it and some other stuff yes. in the show notes in case anyone wants to read it. Um, MemphisTypeHistory.com slash Elmwood. E-L-M-W-O-O-D. Yeah, thanks for thinking of that. I always try to think, what should I put in these show notes? Yes, that's a perfect one. Well, I'm always like, when I listen to a podcast, I'm like, oh, I hope they, because I don't always catch everything. Yes, so. thank you for catching my, <laughs> thank you for catching my show notes for me. For you bookworms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so an end note on this story is during this epidemic, the daughter of the superintendent was named Gracie, and also she was dubbed the Graveyard Girl. She's the one that documented the names of the deceased in the cemetery's red leather logbook. And she began handwriting the names in August of this time with the cause of death as yellow fever. And by September, she would start putting the ditto marks and there are just pages and pages of these ditto marks where people are just coming and dying with the yellow fever. And she was the one who rang the bell each time a body was buried until she contracted the yellow fever herself. Did she die? I looked for that. I didn't see if she died or not. But, Man. But yeah, I mean, I read at one point, there, the peak was in September of people getting this disease. And there was... Somewhere I read where an average of 200 people died every day. I mean, I mean, it was going up to that much of people dying a day. Wow. In September. So, yeah. And it was crazy. 
So that's no man's land. So you have another story maybe to tell me as well? Oh, wait. Rufus the dog. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a little more light. I, I have the story. It's a little more lighthearted <laughs> since that one was heavy. We'll end with it. I was going to tell you about my person who's buried in Elmwood, and then you're going to tell us a lighthearted story. So my person is the madam with a heart of gold. Oh, sweet. So Annie Cook, probably not her real name. Her real name's not actually really known. Uh, owned an upscale bordello, and she became known as the Madam with the Heart of Gold. Aww. So what we know is that she was born in 1840, grew up in Ohio, and then went to a farm in Kentucky to nurse smallpox victims. Hmm. Foreshadowing. Yeah. Oh. She was attractive, probably of German descent, and she moved to Memphis and opened her brothel on Gayoso Street and called it Mansion House. Uh, This was after the Civil War when she opened it, and there were 18 other brothels in town uh, about that same time, but hers was really well known, and it was even listed in the city directory officially as a palatial resort for commercial affection, (laughs) and she was officially listed as uh, Madam. (laughs) Commercial affection. What a turn of phrase. Yeah. That sounds pleasant. Yeah. So... Um, as I indicated, uh, when the yellow fever hit in 1873, she became a nurse again. Um, not like an official nurse, but she sent the girls away and turned her brothel into a, um, hospital. And then she kept nursing people again, like did it again in 1873 when the outbreak got worse, as you kind of went through already. So she nursed people and ended up getting yellow fever herself which seems to be how the stories go. So she got the yellow fever on September 5th and died on the 11th. This is interesting that they our stories connected, even though we didn't plan this. I know, right? When you started telling, <laughs> you're like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> we could almost call this yellow fever episode if we wanted to. <laughs> yeah. But it's Elmwood, guys. It's still Elmwood. Elmwood. So show notes slash Elmwood. Um, okay. So she had an unmarked grave until April 5th, 1979. When the Brothers of the Sacred Heart at St. Mary's Episcopal Cathedral and with the help of a private donor, so them and the help of a private donor put up a tombstone for her in Elmwood and they used a phrase uh, that they found about her in the commercial and the, sorry, the Memphis Appeal. Uh, when they announced her death, uh, they called her the Mary Magdalene of Memphis. Hmm. And so that's what they used on her tombstone. And it says... Uh, a 19th century Mary Magdalene who gave her life trying to save the lives of others. And she was just 38 when she died, actually. Yikes. And, um, yeah. But I thought that was very interesting, just a weird little tidbit. And um, I found a bit from her eulogy from the Memphis Appeal, where she got her nickname Mary Magdalene in Memphis, from September 17th, 1878, that I can read you. Yeah, please do. Out of sin... The woman merged, transfigured, and purified to become the healer. Surely the sins of this woman must have been forgiven her, for her faith has made her whole, made her one with the loving Christ, whose example she followed in giving her life that others may live. That's sweet. Yeah. And apparently that's a very Victorian way to write a eulogy as well. But um bum <laughs> I like when things come around and connect. Okay, I totally forgot, though. I also found... Unless, do you have any questions about Annie Cook? No. I pretty much told you everything I know, but okay. okay. Um, <laughs> there's actually not a lot about her. I even tried to find, like, maybe some kind of picture, mm-hmm. which is obviously a long shot, but um, I couldn't find anything. I was just really curious. But I did find two other people who were buried at Elmwood, and I felt like it was fitting to bring them up. I know we're delaying your lighthearted story even more. <laughs> it's a short story. <laughs> I just, I mean, we just can't get away from Elvis. <laughs> yes. So... Several of his dates are buried in Elmwood, and I'm going to tell you their stories of going on dates with Elvis. You're breaking my heart, Caitlin. I'm just kidding. I'm not. <laughs> they're not. Be- <laughs> okay. So Grace Toof, Toof, Grace Toof, you, you probably know this, is buried there. And Gra- I read the name. And Grace, yeah, same problem here. Just read it, which that's who Graceland is named after. Mm-hmm. She's buried there. And Mary Jenkins Langston is also buried there, and she was one of his Elvis's cooks. But more importantly, she was the one who perfected the peanut butter and banana sandwich. Oh, straight to 
my belly yummy yumminess. Yeah. I'm I love that sandwich. Thank you, Elvis, for introducing me. And thank you, Mary Jenkins Langston, for perfecting it. <laughs> so they are also laid to rest at Elmwood. Oh, look at that. So that was my little story. That's let's see, a lighthearted story. It's Victorian death episode. Yeah. People that are buried in Elmwood. However, there's a story that I'm saying a friend uh, told me. I won't give details of who she is because her name should remain unknown. And the reason is, story goes, her grandfather is buried in Elmwood. And at the time when he knew he would be passing away, uh, he had, I believe, tuberculosis. And he gave a dying wish of, when I die, I want a spot next to me for my poodle Rufus to be buried as well. And you have to understand the bond between him and his dog is very strong. And apparently he's in love with this dog. Nobody else really cares about this dog. Uh, He's kind of a mean dog, but that's his, I mean, Rufus loves his owner and grandfather loves his dog Rufus. So the grandfather tells his son, okay, this is what I need. I need you to bury Rufus next to me. And the son goes to Elmwood and asks if this is a possibility. And they say, no, no, you can't do that. Uh, So the son goes back to his grandfather and says, or yeah, goes back to his dad and says, it sounds like this isn't going to be possible. I'm sorry. And the grandfather flips and says, or his father, that is my only one wish. You got to get this done. This has to happen. This is the only thing I want with my death. So grandfather passes. He's buried at Elmwood. And Rufus is still alive and well. But the day comes when Rufus does pass away. And what does the dad do? He takes a dog, a friend, and they break into Elmwood. And they bury that dog next to the grandfather. And my friend says she thinks that they had even planted a bush next to the tombstone just for preparation, knowing that the dog, they might have to bury that bush out and put the dog in. Yes. So, there are over 75,000 people buried in Elmwood, and at least one of those is a dog that wouldn't be documented. Uh, So, it made me wonder, like, how often would this happen? And I looked it up, and I couldn't find anything that said it was illegal, but it's very possible it could be illegal. And uh, I was like, surely there are people who are really bonded with their pets that they would ask for that. But someone did uh, comment that... Most people outlive their pets. So that's one thing. Yeah. Wow. At least one dog. That's amazing. A Memphis type history scoop. Yep. And if you have your own story, please send it to us. Tell it to us. There's SpeakPipe on our website. You can actually leave us a story with your voice. Yes. Do it. Tell us about your dog burials, Mm -hmm. your own Elmwood stories. Queen Victoria stories, anything. Anybody you know that contracted yellow fever? Yeah, that would be really wild. Yeah. Elmwood, guys. MemphisTypeHistory.com slash Elmwood for show notes and links and pictures and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, what else? We said SpeakPipe. We said show notes. We have not said Patreon. Patreon. Go support us on Patreon, please. Yep. Patreon.com slash Memphis type history for as little as a dollar a month. You can get behind the scenes photos, videos, um, the cutting room floor episodes, which are all the tangents and outbreaks and various things that didn't make it onto this official episode that you're listening to right now. You'll get um, other perks uh, for more than a dollar a month. If you're feeling generous and you want some merch, you get some merch. Mm -hmm. So go check it out. Give us, Open your wallet a little bit, because we want to continue doing this. Yeah, we like digging up history. Digging up history. (laughs) (laughs) Cemetery jokes. All right. Well, this is Memphis Type History, the podcast. We like your type. You've been listening to Memphis Type History, the podcast. It would mean so much to us if you head over to iTunes and give us a rating and review. Be sure to subscribe and never miss an episode. Want to be part of Memphis Type History and get behind the scenes content, merch, and more? Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Memphis Type History. That's Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Memphis Type History. 
find more Memphis Type History on our blog at memphistypehistory.com, on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest as Memphis Type History, and on Twitter at Memphis Type. <laughs>